so it's important to understand what the fundamental differences between Bitcoin and banking are. Um, and I like to break it into three main sections. The first is when you deposit your money with a traditional bank, um, the bank actually owns that money. So you may have heard of um, bail-ins in Cyprus where banks confiscated people's deposits. Um, that's because they own that money and they have the legal right to do that. Um, with Bitcoin, my money is stored on my phone, on my iPad, on my desktop. It's actually stored in, in a cold storage at a bank as well. Um, so you actually own your own money. And so that's a fundamental difference. The second difference is that with Bitcoin, you spend your money as you wish. With banking, there's lots of complex transactions that are happening in the background where the banks are essentially spending your money. Um, whether it goes through a fund manager or whether it goes through collateral for a mortgage or whatever it is, there's a la layers and layers of complexity where people don't know that their money is actually being spent. Um, with Bitcoin, it's, a, it's what's called a peer-to-peer -peer network. So if I transfer money from my phone to your phone, then there's no intermediary in that process at all. It's just my money to you and we own it. If I own it and I transfer it to you, then you own it. Um, the third thing that's different between Bitcoin and banking is the process by which money is actually created. So with a bank, many people don't understand the complexities of how money is created. Um, when, you, when you borrow money from a bank, it's actually new deposits that are created into existence and deposited in your bank. The money didn't exist in the first place. So banks have a license to create money, essentially. It's why we always have an overstimulation of debt, because um, in order for money to exist, you have to have someone borrowing that money into existence. And essentially, banks make a lot of profit out of that process of creating money. It's a very, very lucrative business to be in. With Bitcoin, um, banks uh, don't create money. It's, it's anyone that wants to participate in this network that lends some of their computer power to the network that actually profits from the process of creating those Bitcoins in the first place. And so the profits from money creation or Bitcoin creation are distributed amongst the people using that network. And it gets a bit complicated because what they're actually doing is they're not just speculating on the network, they're actually providing value. Because in the background, when their computers are creating those coins, they're actually verifying all the transactions and making the most secure payment network there is out there. Every bank that I know of has a person employed specifically with the intention of investigating the opportunity that Bitcoin or its related technologies produce. So Bitcoin, the technology behind it, is something that many banks are interested in because uh, it's a global, neutral um, way of transferring any kind of value, whether that's money or stocks or shares or anything. Um, around the world to anyone that's connected to the internet and can participate in the network. That's never existed before. So for traditional financial institutions, that's both a threat and an opportunity. The, the opportunities that banks can gain from implementing the technology behind Bitcoin or working with Bitcoin is um, they can, for the first time, offer transparency to their customers. Rather than relying upon a system where banks have to be honest to regulators and regulators have to implement systems and controls to make sure they are being honest and what time has proven is that humans have an incentive to be dishonest and that's why, why we have these, uh, these systems and these problems in, in banking. What, the opportunity of Bitcoin is for the first time they can prove to their clients that they're, what they're doing with the money, how the money's moving. Um, they can actually implement clearing systems whereby value can be transferred without actually having to rely upon some kind of internal ledger. Um, they can have access to, to global markets on a scale they've never seen before. Um, but the real opportunities are financial inclusion. So traditionally banks um, have only been able to deal with people that have means, that have wealth. Um, if they embrace this type of technology, uh, there's you know financial markets open up to the five billion odd people out there that don't have access to all the credit markets, the banking system and everything. And so the opportunities for anybody, an entrepreneur, um, an individual that wants to use the network, or a bank or a financial institution is that they can get involved in this um, and offer financial services on a scale. It's kind of like, imagine, you know, when, when, uh, when Apple invented the App Store, um, what they essentially did is they opened up Apple's technology 
whereby anybody in the world, an entrepreneur, a financial institution, anyone, could create an application that could be sold on apples and used on people's phones. Um, Bitcoin technology is the same. We don't know what entrepreneurs and, and businesses and financial institutions are going to create, but Bitcoin invented programmable money. And programmable money also translates into programmable financial services. And programmable means that anyone in the world can start coding or pay someone to code and create a solve a problem. Um, traditionally, we had to rely upon banks in a monopolistic environment to create all the innovation because they had access to the system where you can clear money. Now the, now the system to clear money is open for everyone to innovate equally. Bitcoin is like nothing we've ever seen before. Um, it operates so differently from the last few hundred years of financial innovation um, that it's very scary for regulators because um, many of the traditional rules by which they've regulated financial institutions don't actually apply to Bitcoin and blockchain. Um, it does things very differently and it uh, scares them from some of the ways of the world that they've traditionally understood. So, an example is that because every transaction is transparent and anyone can see every transaction, um, the security of the network relies on anonymity of the user because people don't want people to know that they're behind the transaction because it's public for people to see. Um, traditional regulations rely upon financial institutions identifying their customers, knowing their customers, making sure they're not using that money for any kind of illicit activity. Um, so if you apply a traditional regulation, which is attach identity to everybody, um, to a, a system where the security relies on anonymity, you get this strange scenario where uh, they can do you know, anti-money laundering procedures, but it will be at the expense of consumer protection because it makes the network more risky because it relies on anonymity. So there's ways around that and there's lots of things you can do because this is the first transparent financial system that uh, can work without many of the traditional regulations but it, it requires a lot of learning and also you know two of the most jargon rich in, environments in the world are finance and technology when you put finance and technology together you have a really jargon rich geeky environment that's very hard for everyday people to understand and, and also regulators to understand